everybody. I'm Dana Seitler, and I'm the director of the Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. Welcome to the fifth annual Queer Direction Symposium, Indigeneities and Sexualities. I am thrilled so many of you have joined us, and I thank you for being here. I want to thank, I want to thank the, my amazing team at the Center for Sex, Sexual Diversity Studies for everything that they did to make this event happen, Valley Weddick, Victoria Liao, and Cameron Crookston. I owe much gratitude to them for their care and labor. And it's such a pleasure to work with such brilliant and amazing people, so thank you. I would also like to thank Martha McCain and the Global Initiatives Fund that allows us to host Queer Directions every year. And finally, um, I want to thank our panelists that have joined us today. Um, Dana Danger, TJ Talley, Audra Simpson, Joseph Pierce, welcome. Professor Karen Recolette will act as our moderator for the evening and I will introduce her properly in a moment. Uh, first, I wanna give you some information about how the event will proceed. Some of you are in the webinar right now and some of you are live streaming on our YouTube channel. Um, so once the, the talks are over and the Q&A uh, begins, we would uh, like to welcome you to type your questions for us to share with the panelists. If you're in the webinar, you should type your questions into the Q&A um, pull down bar. Um, because the chat is not functioning for you. Um, if you are in the live stream, um, just go ahead and type your question into the chat. And we have somebody there monitoring the chat who will import those questions to us into the webinar. So we will be able to get to, um, we'll be able to see um, questions from everybody um, across formats. And if there are too many questions for us to be able to ask, uh, our panelists to answer tonight. We will copy them and send that the copies of those questions to them so that they can engage with you at some later point um, if possible. So we, uh, yesterday, uh, part of the event was an experimental classroom for graduate students. And we talked about the land of acknowledgement a bit and um, concerns that it might have started acting like a placeholder for actual social change and acts of reconciliation. Uh, for concrete justice on the ground, or perhaps maybe that um, it never did. Uh, so I'm gonna give the land acknowledgement today with this in mind. And I hope that in this space with all of you, um, it doesn't act as an empty performance, but as an invitation to participate in the project of decoloniality. So I'm speaking to you from the University of Toronto. Uh, it, itself a physical and intellectual structure enabled by land theft and the violences of settler colonialism. And I speak to you as a white settler of this land, which is the ter territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Dish with One Spoon uh, agreement recognizes that we live off the same resources, hence protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto or Toronto is still the home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are, are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. We are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and upholding the agreements in place. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you this evening. And now I'm going to introduce Karen Recollet, um, who I thank for joining us as the moderator uh, for this event. Karen Recollet is an assistant professor of women and gender studies at the University of Toronto. She is an urban Cree scholar, artist, and writer whose work focuses on relationality and care as both an analytic and a technology for indigenous movement-based forms of inquiry within urban spaces. Recolette is in conversation with dance choreographers, black and indigenous futurist thinkers, and indigenous and black geographers as ways to theorize and activate futurist, feminist, celestial, and decolonial landing relationships 
with more than human kinships and each other. So please um, join me in, in welcoming her. And I'm going to turn the event over to her now. Thank you. How beautiful. I'm very excited um, and honored to be a moderator for this important and um, generative conversation. I am very excited to be amongst such gorgeous thinkers, like stunning and fierce thinkers um, that have been reworlding, worlding, conceptualizing otherwise for the rest of us that can kind of, that can witness. And I'm very um, interested in how we can land into relation as a way of thinking about the territorial acknowledgement. Well, what are our responsibilities of being ethical witnesses to these kinds of provocations and offerings that we're gonna to experience today? And so one of the reminders that I give myself as I listen, as I witness, are my responsibilities in terms of being non-extractive in my listening processes. So how can I act as an ethical and responsible witness in terms of not looking for the thing or the concept or the vocabulary <laughs> that I want to use for my own research, but rather to be open to the possibilities of those interstices, those magical moments that I don't necessarily have to claim as my own. So I just wanted to put that out there as an invitation for us all to be these radically ethical witnesses in today's conversation. I lit a candle for all of us tonight. I'm very, um, I'm sending my love and my care to all of you in terms of where you're at, the kind of caregiving that you're giving to your families and your kin. Um, we miss you. Uh, we hope to gather again soon in person um, so that we can continue with these kinds of um, leaning into um, spaces, collectives where we can gather in these ways. So having said that, I now have the honor of introducing um, tonight's fierce and gorgeous humans um, into this digital space. And so I'd like to start um, by talking a little bit about these dear people. So Audra Simpson is um, Gananakwe Mohawk, uh, is a professor of anthropology at Columbia University. And Audra's research and writing is rooted within Indigenous polities and the US and Canada and crosses fields of anthropology, Indigenous studies, American and Canadian studies, gender and sexuality studies, as well as politics. And I'd like to also note that Audra Simpson's work has been incredibly meaningful to thinking about the kinds of decolonial futures that we aspire towards. And I just wanna thank Audra for the careful practice, the labor, the work, the worlding um, that you are continue to offer in your provocations and for those that you're going to be gifting us with tonight. Dana Danger, who is joining us as well, is this like fierce two-spirit queer, Métis, Soto, Polish visual artist who uses photography, sculpture, performance, and video to question the lines between empowerment and objectification by claiming space with their larger than life scale work. Ongoing works exploring BDSM and beaded leather fetish masks address the complicated dynamics of sexuality, gender, and power in a consensual and feminist manner. And I'm just so excited to share space with Dana Danger as well. Um, I feel inspired by you and your work and your practice. TJ Tal Tally is an assistant professor, history at the University of San Diego. Uh, he specializes in the comparative settler colonial and imperial history with a focus on South Africa. He is the author of Queering Colonial Natal Indigeneity and the Violence of Belonging in Southern Africa. 
which uses queer theory and critical indigenous studies to examine how discourses of European civilization underpinned colonial legislation that policed white settler behavior and attempted to consign indigenous Africans and Indian migrants to subservient positions. So I would like to offer my gratitude for TJ for um, being in conversation in this gathering. I see you already as being this like gorgeous human. <laughs> I love your smile. I'm very excited to be in conversation with you. Um, Joseph Pierce uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literature at Stony Brook University. His research focuses on the intersections of kinship, kinship gender, sexuality, and race in Latin America, queer studies, indigenous studies, and hemispheric approaches to citizenship and belonging. He is the author of Argentine Intimacies, Queer Kinship in an Age of Splendor, which was awarded the 2020 best book in the 19th century by the 19th century study section of LASA, L-A-S-A. <laughs> I am so I am so honored to be in conversation with you too, Joseph. You know that you are one of my dear ones and I'm very excited about, about this, uh, this offering. So having said that, um, so tonight's conversation is going to be rooted in a series of provocations that our fellow speakers are going to be sharing with us tonight. So let's hold space for, um, Audra, how do you feel about going first? There. I'm fine with going first. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Okay, take it away, Audra. I'm so looking forward to hearing what you, you're offering tonight. Thank you so much, Karen. That was really lovely. It's great to be here. I so wish I was there with you all live. I love Toronto. I love UT. I love Toronto. I have so many friends there and um, I miss you all. Um, and I'm excited about my co-panelists and this conversation. As I said last night uh, to the master class, unironically named master class, um, I've been queer adjacent for much of my scholarly life. And this is because I'm a, a student and a scholar, I think of colonialism and it's uh, an indigenous politics and it's, it's inescapable and, it, and I've always been adjacent. And, and so I was quite shocked and thrilled and surprised to be invited. And I thank uh, Dana and her colleagues for inviting me and hosting me. And I will now share with you um, a paper. Uh, it's a, an, an article that I'm revising uh, that's from my forthcoming book and you'll see what I am up to. Um, this is the everydayness of it all. Let me start this version of my comments tonight, which are abstracted from an article that I'm revising, which is itself abstracted from a book I am working on and have honestly left fallow for this entire pandemic with a turn to the bruteness of sex and history. A history that we all share in some way or another and is being re-temporalized with recourse to the discourse and practices of reconciliation. But I wanna start with this temporal move with the claim of the informal, the unexpected and the everydayness of it all. In a recent conversation, I'm calling this a recent conversation, but this is actually several years ago. In a recent conversation I had, with someone, they reflected upon the residential school experience and said to me directly without hesitation, the church is sex. That is how I understand it. The church is just sex. That is what it was for me. That is what it is. It is sex. This said casually over lunch in a crowded restaurant, the kind with vaulted wood beam ceilings, with tablecloths and cracked pepper mills and uttered casually from a so-called survivor. The survivor who sat across from me is the redefined subject position of those who went to residential school 
and are now referred to in this way and refer sometimes, it sounds like often to themselves in this way. This new subject position takes the cue from genocide studies and the experience of those who came out of the mass industrialized murder of the 20th century on the other side, intact, sort of. To be intact is to survive, to survive the attempt to destroy you. Two, in the case of the Jewish Holocaust, survive the industrialized corporal, corporeal mass killing, the attempt to kill en masse in a willful and targeted project of destroying peoplehood. In the case of Canada, there is a non-industrialized psychological killing, one that is various bodily, cultural, and political forms, but also various forms of force that were and are lethal and have as their object bodies, minds, hearts, culture, lands, and waters. Sex was a technique to borrow Foucault's language, a dense transfer point of power in one regime of killing, a regime that was also a location and a civilizational project, a life project for what an emergent settler state. Here, residential schools were the location where forms of bureaucratic life met corporeal and psychic forms of violence and embedded their efforts in the minds and bodies of Indian children. First, with the help of the Catholic Church and the United Church of Canada, these schools, borrowing from U.S. Colonel uh, Richard Pratt, performed their work to, quote, and the Americans here, if they're listening, should better know this, <laughs> to kill the Indian in order to save the man, and in doing so, attempt to kill Indian children's sense of themselves as Indian, targeting their language, their hair, their culture, and disciplining their tongues and their minds in English and French, away from their own languages. Now, one way of attempting murder on the self and on futures was to use the language, to use in the language of this interlocutor, to have sex. And I'm not confused about this. I don't want to call it this, but this was called as such by this interlocutor, hailing the radically different perspective on this sex to one, rape to another, with children when they are legally entrusted to your care as wards of the state who are to be desavaged, decultured in the pedagogic project of civilization. So let's scale down from this macro societal and political imperative to pedagogically transform native culture and people under the auspices of a civilizational project. One that lasted from the mid 19th century to 1996. This residential school system was to ready indigenous peoples for citizenship through this pedagogic experience away from home, from family, from territory to teach children English or French, to farm, to cook, to clean, to be ready as well for particular forms of gendered and race labor, but assisted by the non-mandated but evident and abundant sexual and physical force. It's the effects and aspects of this force that form a question that calls up this past over and over again, and the endurance of injury and pain in the present. What to do today? with the lives, the impressions, the words, and the language of the aftermath, the psychic and political aftermath of the schools, but also what is interlinked with the school, the law, the state, the system of relations that form an economy that seems to require land that children and their families are still on. What kind of moves will a state make to avert, not a revolution, you know, that's not on the table, not that revolutions are usually discussed, but in parliament, not a revolution, but international shame to find redemption through reconciliation talk, through reconciliation practices, and distance itself from dispossession, enslavement, differently bonded forms of labor, and radical inequalities in the aftermath. These are effects that endure. So the temporality of this assertion, so simply stated to me, the church is sex, brings me to the present day again and again. The church in this statement is, not was. This is the declarative assuredness of experience 
of the present, of fact, a claim upon the ontological, the fundamental being of this institution. But behind it is a state, and within that is the Indian Act of 1876. Scholars of indigenous history will think not only of that act, but also of the Proto-Indian Acts of 1850, 1851, the Act for the Gradual Civilization of the Native, acts that slowly, devastatingly defined land and people for control and presumably, presumably for the taking. In time with the taking of land was the regulation of relations of a sort. But sex between natives was regulated in part by their own systems or our own, their, let's sound really detached, by their own systems of descent and rule making. But in the colonial period, in the first apogee of settler colonialism, marriage became a mode of regulation, recognition and regulation, recognition and regulation. Here I'm pulling, uh, of course, I nod my head to Mark Riskin's uh, uh, 2011 book. Sex or presumed sexual activity lay beneath it and the church atop. Here, Diane Million argues, quote, the religious institutions involved also had complex narratives, both about the heathens, and here she puts the heathen in quotes, and the necessity to save Indians from lives of sin. The construction of native women and men as, quote, sexually depraved or carnal, irrational sexual beings put these people in a position to be the objects of moral injunction, an ancient project between, quote, civilized Western societies and their nemeses all over the world. This imposed category of nemesis could be contained or transformed, it seems, with the regulatory power of sex, if not the deployment of sexual forms of violence. The regulation of relations between a man and a woman of certain ages and of certain bodily substances were enabled not only by ideas about the inherent nature of the children and their parents, but the carceral logics of the schools as spaces of confinement, but also what queer theorists might argue was the utter queerness of the children and the polities that they belong to. By this, I mean the fundamental challenge that some of these polities pose to the normativity of settler mores and customs regarding property, conjugal relations, leadership, and parenting. One need not look far for work in indigenous studies that extends the queerness of native life, not in a taxonomical sense, but in its threat, the threat it posed to differing, different ordering principles, through different ordering principles, different kin relations, to a nascent or fledgling heteronormativity in so-called new lands. My co-panelist, Professor T.J. Talley's History of Zulu Conjugality and Colonial Natal, positions polyamory as a queering threat to social life that then became a justification for intervention. As well, of course, Deborah Miranda's study, I'm thinking of the specific article which I just taught, but you see this in her incredible book, um, Bad Indian, in a, in a much more expansive way, um, study of the joyas, uh, the hoyas, excuse me, and um, we might call it colonial uh, and indigenous California, we find specters of what we might now call gender variance and literal forms of gender variance. So that anti, so anti-normative that became the grounds of what she called a gender side. Now these are two modalities of queerness, one simply an alternative conjugality and political order, another embodied at, with practices that represent simultaneous social and political orders. When we, think what, when we think this here and imagine here and here being Canada, um, of course, I'm sadly not there right now, but when we think this here and imagine children being worked upon as not quite civilized, not quite white, their parents and or the indigenous adults around them were being pulled under the pall of settler law. It was in the production of legal conjugalities here that a proto formula for blood quantum logic was instituted, a logic that haunts indigenous people in Canada today. Those presumed to possess certain amounts of blood and who lived in certain ways, and there's that, that moment in 1850, 1851, where they were trying to sort that out, lived in certain ways. These are non-specified, but in some iterations in a sauvage way, 
a savage way, literally that's the language of the, of the Proto Act, uh, were then recognized as Indians. Those without after 1851 were rendered legally non-Indian so that they could themselves gain or lose status based on the blood they were thought to have or not have. They were regulated out of status for reasons that completely denied the authority of their own legal systems, kinship systems, modes of relatedness and responsibility or obligations to land and water. Matters of their own governance system were rendered moot. The union between a man and a woman was recognized and then regulated through colonial law and thus social and moral systems through the aforementioned act. Colonial recognition or status was conferred by the state for relations then between newly status Indians or a status man, and this is deeply gendered as you all know, and whomever he wanted. Stating a mandate for Victorian heteropatriarchal conjugality, and in this, a banishing not only of governance by women, but a banishing of queerness itself as well. And I want to say here, when I'm just, if I can go off script for a second, as I'm moving through this like tightly rendered, you know, re, re rendering of the Indian Act, and I'm trying to think through those, the various parts of the Act that move together. Um, our colleague at University of Toronto, the um, historian Susan Hill, has written a book that demonstrates with meticulous historical acumen how Six Nations of the Grand River chiefs and clan mothers did everything they can, and she does this, does this with recourse to colonial archives, to actually keep people home. And, and I think a Sue's, and, and, to, and to work around or work work through or work around these very limiting forms of, of gendered uh, law. So I don't want to present this as a contained and perfect system. Indigenous peoples moved through this very, very differently in different cases. And I think Suze is a, an extraordinary model uh, of that kind of, of the kind of research we need to, to prove an otherwise in Canada. Um, and to demonstrate just how much we loved and cared for our children, right? Um, Brenna Bondar, in her recent work, does really important uh, research in, in the colonial lives of property on contextualizing status more longitudinally in this colonial context and into its own origin story of title holding aristocracy in Europe. And here she dwells upon the differences between those, the laboring and the not laboring, the stolen and the stealing. She argues that the transmission of status is a feature of, quote, the identity property nexus that structures inequalities and vulnerabilities, as well as capacity to flourish through time. This concept and practice of social and political stratification, carrying and transmitting rights, no less, through time is unambiguously still a thing in Canada. So much so that one might hear amongst a certain generation of Indians with no degree of hesitation, if so-and-so status or non-status, of course, this is an open, here I am sharing it with YouTube, but uh, you know, it does happen with the older folks. As in, are, you, are they on a ban list or not? As in, can they live at home or not? Can they be buried at home or not? As in, uh, as in actually, we are still very much legally wards of the state. We are still legally in some ways still like children who have our parts and sexual possibilities regulated by this law that is simultaneously propping up Canada as a state that has property. Property rendered from your lands and waters and confers you your right to live there by this notion of status. Departing then from Bondar, we are dealing here with an inverse of an English gentleman in Devonshire with so many sheep, I think that's what they have, uh, and laborers on his property. But we have instead an Indian possessing 6, uh, 6-1-B or 6-2-B status who then has the, the so-called right of not, not a true property, but a property-like right to live at home and build a house without being escorted off the reserve by the police for being in violation of the Indian Act for trespass, for, for the wrong substance of self, for not having status. But I'm not away from things. Let's get back to sex or this casual moment, if we can call it that, over lunch. Now, two years ago, my dining associate did not use the language of, quote, institutionalized pedophilia or, quote, sexual terrorism, that Chief Justice 
Hogarth deployed in his DC Supreme Court sentencing on the monstrous residential school supervisor, Arthur Plint. He's finally dead. His abuses upon Indian boys, quote, resulted in convictions in the late 1990s on 36 counts of sexual assault committed between 1948 and 68. This abuse, not sex, was a longstanding problem in what is now British Columbia and one that has affected families, generations in families in an entire region. Two other employees, Ruth Donald Haddock and David Ford, Ford with an E at the end, were also charged with sexual abuse from the same school. Haddock was moved also from Alberni to a school in Alert Bay where he also abused students. I bring up these fairly well-known abusers to point out what were institutional landscapes of institutionalized and state sanctioned violence and link them admittedly in a different geographic context in a different time to the statement said to me in an offhand way, the church to me was sex. The church is sex. Now there is sex and there is rape and there is abuse and the crucial difference between them, the dividing line between them is drawn through consent. By consent, we will agree it is the permission to the permission given to engage in activity underwritten by inequities and power. In such situations, consent is crucial to protect from harm and perhaps to protect against liability and further harm. The problem of consent in the context of residential schools and in any institutional setting is that the structure is so and was so embedded in unequal relationships with power that no consent can freely be given, and especially so with children. Children cannot consent to the activity of sex. They are not by definition adults that are free to give their permission. They are by definition unfree to consent. And in the case of residential schools, Indian children were doubly unfree as racialized subjects who were not yet citizens or fully rights bearing people. Their parents were not free to consent. Their parents were not yet citizens. They were also wards of the state themselves, legally imagined as children who were being ready for civilization as well. Until 1951 in Canada, status Indians uh, would status Indians would quote lose their rights or their Indian status if they went to university or joined the military, actions or tried to have a drink, actions that placed them outside of the domain of children and entered them into the rightless yet somehow rightful place of the citizen and the non-Indian, the settler, the children who went to residential schools were of a group that was being conditioned on a more macro level to be made citizens through these social and educational laboratories of civilization. So if the church was sex, the church was also school, it was the state, it was the substitute parent. It was a place then of becoming civilized, sex subjected as an almost citizen who still was not white, but was being resubjectivized as white and civilized not only through English, but as this interlocutor would have it over lunch, over a tablecloth, in a somewhat fine dining situation through sex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Audra. That was brilliant. Um, so many offerings to think through, um, so many also um, entanglements in kinds of thinking about like how do we land and how was um, relation, the re regulation of relation is sort of what really stands out to me um, as a space making practice or as a landing practice for settler coloniality as it moves into um, landing in relationship with indigenous bodies. Um, I really appreciate your deep thinking in, in your offering and the generosity of those provocations. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Dana, um, I'm also interested in sort of like thinking through, I know that your gestures and your vocabularies are very image and visual, um, and I'm very interested to see um, maybe how these can fall into relation with some of the ideas that have been shared. Um, but also I'm just like super interested in where you are right now, sort of what you're doing, what kind of creative work you're creating. So if you'd like to go ahead, now is the time. Thank you so much. 
Oh my goodness. The one thing I need to say right now, as a recovering Catholic, I just really feel like what Audra is saying about church and sex. And I'm like, whoo, you know, I say recovering Catholic because I was raised Polish Roman Catholic. So I feel that, yo, oh my goodness. <laughs> so uh, on that note, um, Anin, Dana Danger, Indigena Cause, um, Makwa, Indodem, uh, Métis, Soto, Polish, and Da, Treaty One Territory, or so called Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Java. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dana Danger. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I see myself as a two spirit, indigenous queer, whatever sort of like flavor <laughs> uh, term to identify me as being indigenous and queer. Um, yeah, and just like, uh, and what else? Uh, what, what other hats do I wear? So many different hats. Um, just to say that um, I'm Miti Soto on my mom's side and on my dad's side, um, Polish. Uh, my great grandmother, Madeline uh, Campbell or McLeod came from Camperville, Manitoba. So that's where she grew up on the land. She was born there on the land too. So I always like to give a shout out to her. She's still kicking it, 99 years old. I just love flexing that my great grandmother's 99 because you know, she's she's been uh yep yeah, she's been surviving um and you know then she's still thriving this woman eats like a horse and still is smart as a whip so once that once you know when she stops eating then there's going to be some there's going to be cause for concern but until that day we're good um i wanted to share a little bit about um my practice um visually thinking through a lot of these um, a lot of these ideas and concepts and just like around queerness and indigeneity and like how that's kind of like been how that I kind of communicate that through my concerns because um, um, as much as I love uh, writing I feel like visual representations are the ways in which like work best for me to communicate these ideas and just before we start I just want to Actually, no, I'll do that after. I'll show it on the way. I just, um, I'm currently beating as we're talking, which has been really great. It really helps me stay in conversation. And as a person, you know, um, as we all are, I really need to be moving, using my hands in order to take things in too. So I highly always encourage people to do those sort of practices. So I've just been working on this flower. I've never made flowers before, but I'm doing the edging right now. And so I'm just doing fill. So I don't really have to think about it, but it just takes so damn long, you know? Um, so, takes so damn long, it really does. Okay. So I, oh, screen sharing is paused. Room zoom share. Okay, sorry, I just wanna make sure I can pause this. Um, there we go. Yeah, I'm not as great at this uh, pause and share or screen sharing this pause. No, here we go. It kind of just like wants to move and I don't want it to move. I'm like really trying to control things here and <laughs> want to go back to this other image. Yeah. Whenever I put it into the slideshow, it just wants to move forward. So let's just try this again. Thank you for sharing with us that beadwork that you're working on. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting to see the relationships between the making itself and yes. sort of like the thought space that you're creating as you're, you know, making, I think about rupture a lot when we go through fabric yes. and then loop around and come back. So thank you for sharing that process with us. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So I think this is the right, can we see, do we see this image? They're coming? Yes. Okay, so um, my work has like started from this place of, um, this work is called Big Guns, and it was really just looking at the ways in which, hmm, I don't yeah, like we're this. Not, we're yeah, we're not seeing it. Yeah. Okay, you're not seeing it. Okay, one second. Love this. Love this for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, awesome. like, <laughs> I'm just like perspiring like yeah. intensely. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm like, what? Okay, here we go. We're going to try this one more time. We got this, Boots. We're going to figure this out. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
I know. I see that this is going. I don't want to share this anymore. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so it's still going through. It's kind of like wanting me to share this screen, but I don't want to share it. Stop share. That's really weird. I'm just trying to get out of that thing right now. Sorry, guys. One more second. Just trying to figure this out. It was also really interesting to kind of think through like time travel, Audra, in your um, offerings today. You know, I was thinking through mm -hmm. the, the transferring whiteness of whiteness through time. And I think that that's interesting if we were to kind of think about like indigenous futurisms and how oftentimes um, those kinds of time traveling kind of languages, we I, I haven't seen them really conceptualized in a way that talks about like settler colonial processes. Um, so yeah. thank you for that offering as well. Yeah. All right. Can we see the image? We yes. See? Okay. Yep. Great. Mm -hmm. Finally. Okay. So I'm not going to go all fancy with the black background because then I lose control of the system and I haven't figured out how, how to control it yet. So this is another thing of just like thinking about my Anishinaabe like understandings of like, okay, I know this lesson about when you, when you get a new tool, you got to really explore it all before you really take it on. Um, we want to know everything about the system before we implement it. So I'm just like, okay, lesson learned. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with this um, image from the cover of um, Canadian Arts Kinship uh, magazine back in 2017 that was um, edited by um, now known as uh, Yaz uh, Morgan. Uh, formerly known as Lindsay Nixon. I'm just saying that just to respect all the work and the writing that they've done while they're undergoing like name change, um, just to kind of situate, because it's very important to our kinship because they will be, um, they'll be coming up in the work after. I am very messy. I love to uh, work in very, um, uh, in intersecting circles often. I like to work with folks that I've worked with before and like multiple, like having these multiple conversations over and over. So this, um, image of Adrian came about um, after many, since 2011, thinking about this idea of um, big uns, which is a slang for big ones. And this slang came from this feminist article that I can't remember at the top of my head right now, but there was three scholars that were looking through uh, Bow Hunter magazines. And um, they were looking at the language that was used in like mainstream hunting magazines. And that there was this interesting connection between the feminization of animals um, by hunters, uh, specifically in their language. So big uns is referring to the antler, like when you get a big one. But if you look up big uns or big ones on the internet, if you Google search it, you're going to see pictures of breasts. So I see these really interesting, like, I think like they're not that interesting. But like, they're interesting in the sense that you're like, huh, what's going on here? But not interesting in the sense of like how it completely erases like, you know, animals, their processes, their ways of living, and also just kind of like projects these like kind of like sexualizations and objectifications on us. And it's interesting that it's being done through hunting cultures, like um, specifically mainstream hunting cultures. Um, and so, you know, like uh, words, like they would refer to turkeys as like redheads or um, even undesirable animals like as old maids. So kind of like using a lot of this really gendered language of like um, undesirable, you know, like older animals being less desirable, you know, there's not that much chase into it, all that sort of language. I'm like, oh, this is very interesting and informative. And then, you know, asking friends of mine that I'm really close to and people, this is this whole series was just based off of volunteer of, of people wanting to volunteer themselves to be a part of this idea that really challenged that line of when are we objectified? When are we empowered? And do we have any sort of control in that? You know, especially within if mainstream sort of like society or like how um, how our images are being communicated, um, our visual, like our visual images or visual representations who has kind of like control over that. And I just really wanted to create a space where you would walk into a gallery and just be surrounded by this herd of like badass, like women, trans, non-binary, you know, essentially not cisgendered men, like it's everybody else, it's like everybody else, <laughs> like take up this space, rock an antler over your crotch and like look at the camera and give me all you got, you know? Um, I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of my practice 
um, is really based around is really ongoing consent based. And in order to be able to do this work, I have to I had to really challenge myself as a person um, behind the camera who has a lot of power when we think about lens based practices and like really I'm showing you a perspective and um, I'm telling you to look here. But also, I really want to talk about the, you know, the the bodily and visual sovereignty of the of the individuals. Like I don't call anyone models, even my language around it. I'm very careful because these are individuals that you're looking at. These are people um, that like, yes, are close to me, but, you know, have families of their own, have lives and dreams and all these sort of things. And so let them let them be freaks then if, <laughs> or you know not even just a, I say freaks and like but it's really just um always that I find that I'm responding to what the normative is and really this is just like really just giving people permission to exist and belong and and have a say over um how they present their body um what was really interesting in this series is that I found the um, definitely really brought to light the sort of like um, who has acceptance of their body, who is going to be desired, who wants to be photographed, and who is also dealing with overt sexualization and fetishization of their bodies. So obviously brown, indigenous, black folks are, um, had very different, under, like had very different um, concerns and understandings when we were talking about this work of like how it might affect them moving forward. Also just be um, this idea, like the, um, the idea of the naked body being fetishized, like in, implicitly because of this um, gaze that exists, this like white Western cis heteronormative gaze that we, when we look at something, we're like tr already trying to compartmentalize it into a box. And I really just like wanted to break, breathe that space into like just letting us like figure it out for ourselves you know that um and how we can do that in safe um ways and so in one of those this is what I was hopefully trying to create and it really just even comes down to my ethics with how I work with folks um i.e like none of these images exist on the internet they're always usually in spaces um I always get permission from folks before I send you know, send the images off. And I try to do that the bet to the best that I can. Of course, it's a lot of work, but for me, it's the only way that it makes me, it's the only way that I can feel comfortable um, consent, like that I know that people like, you know, that they trust me, that they know that I'm gonna check in with them and that they have a say. So at any point, if people didn't want their image to be included in this work anymore, they tell me and I remove it, you know, and so, what are the different ways in which we can mitigate that harm, you know, even through our art practices or when we're talking about image and ownership and that, you know, especially because I have so much power when I'm behind the camera, you know, and I'm making these decisions. How can I like, you know, try to share in that reciprocity, you know, and so from this work really came into, you know, still working with um, other uh, with other kin and really thinking about um, siblings and our relations to each other um and so then i started to work on a lot more personal work with me and my sister uh who looks straight off the boat from poland but <laughs> you know i made these like funny i made these like i think these are beautiful images of both me and my sister and kind of bringing in that symbolism once again of the horse tails like you see a lot of like these repeating sort of symbols and images that come into my into my work and where they are very personal i feel like there's there's something that people can also attach to that. People are going to bring their own visuals, like, you know, understandings of perspective when they come to this work, you know? And like, it's so funny to me because a lot of this work can be very serious and sexy, but most of this stuff comes from jokes. Like this was a joke me and my sister had because when she got her Métis card in the mail, her face, she's so white that her face was like blending into the background. And I was just like, just like laugh, you know, just like kind of like laughing at her, like it with it, like, you know, just teasing her with that. And then I kind of like um, did a, I wanted to do some sort of a diptych of of us as like siblings, um, per, you know, pre like presenting ourselves in this certain way, and also just the, like the relationship. Like at this point, we had never lived apart from each other. Both of us really like raised each other um, in that sense uh, when we were growing up, and just like wanting to keep that bond going, even though we're not even in the same city. And I think that that's something that I often see within even two spirit communities is that we're not, you know, sometimes we are far away from each other, um, that like we may be living a halfway across the, 
the the so-called Canada and like how do we keep those things going and like these relationships going and wanting to come together and for me art has been that vehicle that has been able to bring me to other you know people that identify as being non-binary indigenous to spirit indigiqueer like looking for your people you know because you don't always necessarily find that back at home you know for a lot of two-spirit people fleeing to the city was like the way was a, like an out of just like um you know of how we you know how you come kind of, you can compartmentalize yourself in community so from this work that was like really like out there I really started to think about the you know from doing this work thinking about visibility and refusal a lot and like and the ways in which we refuse and like um and that I know that so many people are talking about that and I love that as a concept of like when we when we share things and when we don't and for me this is what masks was all about masks was that was a really about like showing such intimate personal stuff and yet there is there there is um very active things that are going on here that are not letting you have access to the to the full you know this to this indigenous person's body mm -hmm. um and there's like some suggestive like nudity, but it's really, I really wanted to bring in that tension, you know, of like making something sexy and you want to look at it, but here's this person looking right back at you, you know, and like following you with their gaze. Um, and it was just like one way that I was like trying to disrupt that, you know, to make people really look and think about it because, you know, um, also because the masks are like, these images are like 60 by 75 inches. So they're massive. They're like giant, giant size. And that was really intentional. I really wanted these, these portraits to really take up that space. And even like including people together, like you can see there's a little hand that's coming in because it belongs to this other person. And it was really just me being like, hey, you like um, Jazz and Sasha, I really just like love you as kin. I would love to photograph you together because I see your relationship together. And I just think that would be something so special to share, you know, and a lot of the, like a lot of this is just like, you know, um, for me is just like getting people to come together and um to like kind of like live out these fantasies or realities that we don't always get like we don't always get access to sometimes and like where is the space for like you know um, black indigenous sort of like kinky like love and all those sort of representations that don't like that aren't always answering to like this like white perspective of what bdsm is supposed to be and that i find that inherently because we're such relational peoples you know maybe that's a generalization but for myself speaking because i'm so relation like because of my relationalities and my my you know my friendships i want i want there to be spaces where we can express that you know um and that to show other types of visuals that are out there um than the ones that that we um have seen and like what would i as a young you know as a young two-spirit youth what would have been um something for me like what would have been something that would make me go uh-huh you know because like you know, driving, I remember driving down Main Street once and I saw this woman with a shaved head and she had this dude on a chain and collar and he had a shaved head and they're just like walking down the street in public. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> you know, and it just kind of like um, maybe racially or all those certain things. I didn't understand it, but at the time I really was like, I want to do that to somebody. And I would love if it was cons like, you know, and I want to do that consensually, you know, I would love for somebody, you know, to like walk somebody around like a dog or something like that, you know, that'd be so fun. I didn't even know that these were possibilities, you know, that we could have these things. And so like bringing this sort of stuff to light, you know, I think so much often about the erasure of, of um of our roles in society of us just being in like in our communities and like really having now to define our roles and um that there is a lot of power in that reclamation but also yeah like what is what does that mean in the in the overall context and what does that mean to our other relatives and how they see us and understand us and that we're like we don't want to be creating this otherness within our own communities and so that's why i really want to put forward sometimes these challenging images you know, of um, of how we express our desire and pleasure, you know, because I think about, you know, if I even think about very basically, just like even basic understandings of residential schools, thinking of just even the gender, um, the just the, the, the separation of gender of like, you can't even talk to your siblings or cousins because they're male or female. And then where does that mean for the rest of us that never saw ourselves in those two boxes? 
where did they go? Well, they were obviously, they were obviously there, but like that complete erasure to your experience and your understanding, you know, um, is very, very much felt. And so this just gives you kind of like an idea of the masks in the space of like, I wanted them to really kind of take up space as well. Um, yes, which kind of brings me to the next sort of thing that I was, was starting to work on, which is this new work that this is called hashtag Métis AF. And it's because and for those of you that maybe don't know, um, uh, infinity symbols are like really big in the Métis community. We have like both blue and red flags that have it on there. And I just thought of this like joke of, you know, getting this little Métis trans stamp just to like remind whoever, even whoever I'm having sex with will remember that I am indigenous. <laughs> so these little funny markers that we have on our bodies and just the, the hilarity around that and how this kind of like, this image is kind of like a response to time of like being able to sit down. Um, I was like sitting for like hours trying to learn how to tough this make this um, mask that you see now, which is uh, Janine Freyna Jutli. This is a mask that I made for for her, and like the little tufts that exist on her face were from that knowledge transfer of sitting down on this like kind of um, sinew kind of like um, woven chair that I had which I just thought was so funny, just thinking about paddles and things like that and just mark making, especially in a response to Jean's work where she was pressing beadwork into her skin and then photographing it. And just like that inherent connection that we have to our beadwork as part of our body as well of that, like maybe, and also just like the ideas of gift giving, belongings, you know, this is something that I really wanted to challenge myself on with these masks because I make these masks for these kinship masks I make for my community, but um, they, uh, and it's made like, it's very personal too, because a lot of it is like the, there's tat very personal tattoos that I put on top of the mask. Like it's literally looking at different sort of like ways in which they've put maps on their body and how to communicate that through beadwork. Um, and also like, and literally on your face while also hiding your identity at the same time. So there's all these different like layers and sort of like mm -mm -mm, good things that are going on. Um, and this is just sort of showing just like the it on display and you can kind of see that there's like something that's going on on the side of the mask, which was also this knowledge transfer of like how we used to, um, how we used to do beadwork and these sort of like, um, uh, these kind of ways, ways before paper and pencil of like pressing beadwork into something else and then tracing it out after, you know, these different kind of like um, these indigenous knowledges and technologies that have been passed around in community and how we share that and like learn about that and that when I pressed the, the beadwork that I was working on into this mask, it just stayed. It didn't want to like fluff back up, you know, maybe over time when you use it, it kind of fades out, but that's fine, you know, and then this just sort of showing um, that, that we made kind of like these rattles out of like dirt devils, because in our, <laughs> in our, uh, in our process, we actually beaded whips together. So we, we kind of like use the reference of dog whips that, um, are in Gwich'in, um, in Gwich'in, um, society and, uh, um, these whips that are meant to make noise, you know, they're meant to make noise to kind of get the dogs to go, but there's no actual physical contact that happens. So I really love that as an idea of both of us who are Indigenous and having, um, I think at the time we were just like really, we were very much intellectually thinking more inwards and like the physicality of like hitting someone with a, a whip in front of people was just not, we were, we were just like not, not open to doing that in a public space. So what could we do instead? So we were hitting the physical concrete floor with these whips and the beads just went everywhere. We spent so much time, you know, um, so like um, threading, uh, braiding these, uh, these whips together and then to, to completely destroy them. But then we took these vacuums and vacuumed the beads up and turned them into rattles and then sang to each other. And we were, this was in so-called Kingston. So this is where um, P4W originated, uh, which is the Kingston Women's Prison where the Strong Woman song came from, where it really came into power um, in that space. And for us as indigenous peoples, it's really, I don't know, whenever I go somewhere, I have to really like know who was there before and what is that history. And Kingston specifically has such a violent history as like so many um, prison, uh, there's so many prisons there. I was supposed to be the capital of Canada, but I don't know what happened. All of these stories that I heard there. So it's like, um, you know, as an indigenous person, you 
yeah, it's kind of hard for me to be in this space without recognizing those ancestors who came before as well. And this was a really intimate moment because after we had finished, um, after we had finished uh, using those uh, vacuums as rattles, we like use this contact mic that uh, Janine often uses because you can use contact mics and put it on the surface of every anything and make music. So we like literally put it between our lips and we sang to each other and the vibrations of that song coming out really it was just so incredible and so intimate it's like everybody disappeared and it was just me and Janine like really thinking about those women who who really survived like a prison that like they said wasn't even fit for bears you know like it was that kind of situation and really just like honoring them because I think so often they're forgotten about and they have names and even now like the fact that I can't remember it off the top of my head you know it's somewhere I've written it down but in order to just be able to say those names to remember those um those things and so then from a lot of this work became a lot more thinking about the the masks not so much in this floating space of like you know the white kind of like fashion photography like subject was really trying to put these um, these individuals and masks in physical space. So I've been doing a lot more um, experimenting with that um, within this work and kind of bringing in the medicinal, the medicines. I had a lot of sage going at the time and just really trying to honor that relationship that this person has with their mask, you know, and really challenging those like the protocols of belongings for folks which then kind of like eventually took me to the more personal place where I'm at right now. And that's, this is called Kinky Bundle. So as for those of you, you know, who have bundles, there's, we have so many different protocols for so many different communities of like what that may look like or what you carry in your bundle. And so I have some sacred objects that I haven't included. This really for me is like, what would, what would be like, the ideal bundle that I would have like my smudges, I'd have like my insertable dildo, I'd have my beaded flogger, I'd have my beaver tail um, paddle, which is which was sold to me as a mosquito, like a mosquito swatter. And I was looking at it and I was like, ain't nobody gonna hit mosquitoes with that. That piece of leather wants to hit ass. That's what it wants. <laughs> so, you know, and there's my tobacco, my black latex gloves, because, you know, we got to we got to promote the, the barrier protection and like um, also talk and then gives me the ability to talk to talk about ongoing consent. And what does it mean for me to show you my bundle, you know, because I was always taught that your bundle is your own and you must be you must be mindful of who you show that to, you know, you're really showing like this inner deeper part of yourself. So, um, yeah, so. I'm not sure where we are at the time. I could, you know, go on forever, but that's just a little bit about my practice and the the thoughts behind some of these images. And um, yeah, gorgeous and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, go for it, y'all. I gotta, I gotta literally follow the amazingness that was that. That is rude, uh, Dana. That was amazing. I mean, I'm just. Also, yeah, that just brought me so much joy. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled, everybody, to be here. Um, there is, of course, like any other academic, like a deep abiding sense of imposter syndrome. But one of the best parts about having been with these beautiful people for the last 24 hours has been like the fact that we are all working through things together. We are all in this community and it's been really great. So I'm I'm very thrilled to be part of this. So I uh, just really quickly, so um, hi everybody, I'm really excited to chat with you all today. I am TJ Talley, I identify as black and queer. Um, I'm specifically a historian of um, indigeneity, settlement, queerness, um, and my first project, um, which got a unexpected sassy shout out from Audrey Simpson, um, it, it's called Queer and Colonial Natal, and it's about, um, sort of indigeneity and questions of belonging. And so I wanted to read some of the, the theoretical work that's happening here. Um, and then with a little bit of time, I just want to sort of gesture out towards what the next project is. Um, and so um, I do want to tell you sort of what the stakes of the project is, um, so that what that first project is and how I think through my work. So I was trained as a, um, as a 19th century British colonial historian. And I was explicitly trained um, in Isi Zulu as well, um, the indigenous language, one of the um, 11 official indigenous languages of South Africa, the most widely spoken indigenous language in the country. And 
specifically as a 19th century British colonial historian, my job and my passion was to dismantle, destabilize, and trouble that, to queer that. And that is really what this project is, right? How do we queer and really look at how these normative underpinnings work? So, and the next projects that are growing out of this, the next book project is a comparative project between South Africa, Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, British Columbia, and Utah, because I'm working on 19th century questions of um, settler um, monogamy and indigenous forms of polygyny. And so thinking about the ways in which um, polygyny, but polygamy more broadly is constructed in relationship to civilization and which gives us new ways of thinking about, for example, um, what does it mean in the sort of 19th century emergent North American settler states about questions of progress and the body, things like that. But I'm super jazzed to talk about more things like that if we have time in the Q&A, but I do want to get into sort of like what the heart of this is. So I'm going to read some words at you. So, um, but what I'm going to do is, first off, to set the stage, um, my work really does in this first, in the first book, really focus on a colony in Southern Africa called Natal. Now Natal is in the extreme Southeast corner of South Africa. Um, and it was originally inhabited by Unguni language speakers who came under the hegemony of the Zulu royal family under the leadership of the most noted chieftain, uh, Shaga Gasenza Kakona. And um, uh, after 1838, this, this was briefly occupied by Dutch speaking Fortrekkers. And then in 1843 um, until 1910, this was a British colony that then became absorbed in the Union of South Africa. And is today the province of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. So um, I wanted to give you some of that. And what I really do in this project is a 19th century angry archival queer theoretical piece. And I look at queer theory and indigenous studies and I try and put them together. So I'm gonna give you a little bit about how we do those and how we put them together and the whole point of what this is. So. Um, first off, what does it mean to do queer theory in Natal, right? And so for me, I was first drawn to the imaginative potential of queer theory as a graduate student at the University of Illinois when I first started trying to think through the shared stakes of settler colonialism, indigeneity, and claims of belonging. Now for me, queer theory is most productive in its destabilizing aspects. A queer theoretical read of a subject can seek to understand just how the norms that underpin structures of power are created and to peer beyond the claims of hegemonic groups to see how these norms are made and unmade on a daily basis. In thinking through queer theory and its application in colonial Natal, I'm critical of the ways in which institutions like marriage, the family, the church, the military, all the usual suspects, generally depend upon assumptions of heteronormativity, um, heterosexual reproduction, and proper behavior. Now to do this involves thinking critically about intersectional relational forms of gender identity, from thinking through pre-colonial African women's roles to the forms of bricolage created by the collision of colonial missionaries and indigenous social norms. And if we're thinking about queer theory, so many sort of aspects if we, if, of what seem to be standard queer theory texts, right, which is already a problematic phrase, but so many of them can be applied to understand colonial at all. If we think of, for example, of Judith Butler's talk about gender as performative and heterosexuality as a project always on the brink of failure, this helps us understand how settler colonialism operates as a series of actions that are always attempted to be performed and are always on the brink of failure and people are lying to each other that it's working, right? Um, this also helps us understand things like um, boarding schools for white children, right? So particularly in Natal, the idea of settler boarding schools um, were a space where white male power is inculcated through quotidian acts of violence, where it can be reserved unto specific people and how they learn how to be white and male, right? Thinking of the ways in which gendered claims to authority and autonomy can be remade in relational contexts also illuminates much about indigenous Zulu masculinity as authors like Ben Carton, Jeff Guy, and Mark Hunter have demonstrated. And if we have to think through, but thinking through Michel Foucault's understanding of knowledge, power, and the body, especially elaborated by Stoller, really help us think, along with Anne McClintock, on an insistence that gender and sexuality must be core components for understanding colonial interactions, right? At its heart, it goes back to what Audre said, right? Not only is the church, the school, it's about sex, right? It's about these interactions. That's what queer theory can give us. The idea that hegemonic structures of power require forms of embodied discipline and control. So that's a little bit about queer theory. Now let's talk about indigenous studies, right? So 
My work seeks to connect Natal to the larger contemporary world of 19th century settler colonialism. And that's something that's profoundly missing in academic work on South Africa, I think in general. And I think conversely, right, the study of, of settler colonialism and more broadly the powerful indigenous critiques we're in have enjoyed new prominences in histories of North America and Australasia as a means of understanding the relations that structured both colonists and the originary inhabitants of these lands. Yet with few exceptions, this framework is not widely applied to Southern Africa and Natal in particular. And I would argue that some of these are legacies of colonialism itself. Some of these are um, how white supremacy functions. And some of these are very necessary, painful and complicated conversations that we need to have with each other about the ways in which the phrase indigenous is often already seen and packaged as not including people who are phenotypically understood as black. Right, and the idea in which indigeneity is often seen as, an, as a black exclusive or an either or. Right? And there are plenty of people doing amazing, incredible work um, about how people who identify as both black and indigenous do this work. There's also, of course, work by people like Tiffany Lithabo King that think about how these can be productive together. But also I think it's really important, and I'm also happy to talk about this after, that we must understand that black people are indigenous to place. <laughs> and, and I think often one of the legacies of chattel slavery and colonialism is that there has been a concerted effort to deny Black indigeneity, right? And I do not mean this as a zero-sum game in places like Turtle Island, right? But I do mean that in a moment where Black people are often understood as almost being without origin. And so we must recognize in South Africa, this is very easy for me to work through because they are Native people, right? And so this is how this was a profoundly useful and really meaningful theoretical framework especially for me as a Black North American with my own complicated investments. So um, Settler Colonial Studies situates the inherent conflict between indigeneity and settler nationalist claims to belonging within a larger framework of marginalization and appropriation for grounding the historic violence that structures these nationalist assertions of autochtony in sites of recent or aspirant European settlement. And so I have to use the overused Patrick Wolf quote, I apologize, but as Patrick Wolf says, Southern colonialism destroys to replace, right? They come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event. And one of the things that's really critical for this, for an understanding of Southern colonialism as a social and political formation must involve, as Audra already pointed out, um, a recognition of its inherently genocidal orientation from settlers towards indigenous peoples. And one of the things, again, that I think goes back to this is there is a reticence to imagine this in an African context because people um, don't imagine that there is a genocidal ideation and I will tell you as a 19th century historian, that is absolutely not the case. In South Africa, there is 100% in a colonial context, genocidal ideation, right? This, and it is explicit in London, in parliamentary records, in Natal, in the Cape, they're explicitly not only saying, we desire, imagine, and hope for the disappearance of these native peoples, but they explicitly compare them to North America, to Australia, and to Aotearoa. They see these as models. Right. And so there needs to be a complicated historical understanding of these interconnections, right, that there is a an imaginary for this, a genocidal imaginary. And so I think that some of this work, that that's one of the things that Indigenous Studies also explicitly offers for thinking about Natal, that prizes that open, because I think there's been some a, a lack of that. So we've got some queer theory. We've got some Indigenous Studies. How do we do them together, sweet babies? So for me, a queer theoretical approach has allowed scholars to analyze not only instances in which subjects evince a sexual identification that is not explicitly heterosexual, but also the ways in which particular actions or positions can challenge larger normative systems. A queer reading then can offer an exploration of how lines of assumed order are skewed by ideas, actions, or formations. If settler colonialism is presented itself as a form of orientation, of making a recognizable and inhabitable home space for European arrivals on already occupied land, the native peoples and their continued resistance can serve to queer these attempted forms of order. Now in such circumstances, the customs, practices, and potentially the very bodies of indigenous peoples can become queer, despite remaining ostensibly heterosexual in their orientation and practice as their existence constantly undermines the desired order of an emergent settler state. So following the sign of inquiry, theorists like Scott Morganson, Sarah Ahmed, and Jody Bird have questioned the theoretically normative underpinnings of settler occupation and orientation for indigenous bodies and lands, which I think is also some of the amazing work that is being destabilized by Sweet Dana Danger over there, 
right? So this has potential for producing forms of decolonizing praxis in contemporary settler societies, as well as providing a powerful means of critically engaging with established normative frameworks in a wide range of settler states, right? So um, a queer read of settler colonialism then can allow for theorizing about the genocidal acquisitive desire inherent within efforts to remove and replace indigenous peoples. What would it look like to exist in a space where the reproduction of one group was encouraged directly at the expense of another? We know, but I feel like actually just positive, like phrasing that sentence is very important, right? In the context of a place like Colonial Natal, this includes using the specter of indigenous African social and sexual formations, such as polygyny or ilaboro, which is the ceremonial offering of cattle from one family to another, to simultaneously denote threats to European dominance, as well as define what constitutes proper or civilized settler behavior. So an approach that combines queer theory with indigenous critique has the power to profoundly unsettle the presumptions of a settler state to lay claim to the bodies and lands of indigenous peoples. The logics of settlement, which, which presuppose a demographic ledger domain, whereupon new European immigrants must replace the indigenous peoples whose lands they hope to assume, requires a determined emphasis on reproduction, both physical and social, in a contested colonial space. With the bodies of indigenous peoples deemed queer by settlers for resisting their attempts at cultural and social hegemony, sexuality and heteronormative reproduction become paramount in a settler colonial context. And while indigenous practices may themselves be read as heterosexual by European observers, their existence and the existence of alternative social and sexual formations outside of a replicating settler vision can present a queer threat to the imagined, desired, dreamed of reproductive futurity. And the continuance of indigenous social formations like polygyny and the question of limited settler demographics continuously reveal the anxieties surrounding reproduction and futurity at the heart of spaces like colonial Natal. Sweet, and I wanna push over a little further. All right, so we've done all this. I've given you some core theory. I've given you some indigenous studies. What's the actual payoff? Tally, why are you here? That's a good question. I ask myself that a lot. So the payoffs I believe are twofold. First, combining queer theory with indigenous studies produces a powerful critical synthesis by thinking through the colonial record with an eye for both structures of power as well as the norms that enabled them. I am able to destabilize visions of settler colonial society in the archival record. In doing so, issues like that of indigenous polygyny or ukulobola, the ceremonial offering of cattle, road marriage, they can become sites of intensely contested meaning, power, and identity between European legislators, indigenous peoples, and very busybody missionaries. Consequently, African men and women challenge the claims of settlers to possessing a monopoly on social and sexual order in the colony and consistently undermined imperial projections. As a theoretical framework, a queer and indigenous approach to places like Natal allows for a troubling undermining read of settler claims and opens the possibility of looking at indigenous thought and intervention. Second, a queer indigenous studies reading in Natal's colonial history puts pressure on queer theory more generally, and girl, it needs it. So much has been written about the limits of queer theory, particularly in light of its colonialist Western framework. Most notably, Nigerian anthropologist Ifi Amadiome has taken to task Western readings of indigenous sexual and social practices under a larger universal queerness as rightfully a form of cultural imperialism. Indeed, by extrapolating theoretical understandings of gendered and sexual norms from Western perspectives, Queer theory can run the risk of reinscribing imperialist identifications on the lives and identities of African and other indigenous peoples. One crucial way of avoiding this pitfall lies in identifying that queer identifications are relational. As a consequence, for peoples or practices to be labeled queer, these targets need not be non-heterosexual, a claim really advanced by scholars as diverse as Kathy Cohen and Mark Rifkin. Now, such an innovation can therefore draw upon a diverse range of queer and indigenous sources, ranging from Gail Rubin's hierarchies of appropriate sexualities, which she rendered in that pyramid way back in 84, um, or Franz Fanon's invocation of the profoundly othered Black subject in order to show the ways in which a queer subjectivity can exist as an external label and not as an internalized identity. Let me tell you, as a mixed race Black person, I was queer before I learned that I, my sexuality did, did not line up with heterosexuality. I was already quirk, so I had to find other ways to understand this. 
The simultaneous use of an indigenous-centered approach also challenges us to think of the ways in which notions of troubling sexuality and gender may still involve relying on Western epistemologies of notion or notions of stable categories, a position that should be constantly and critically assessed all the time. So thus, doing the work of queer indigenous work in the tall allows us to both queer settlement, but also indigenize queerness. Now by queering settlement, I refer to the work of destabilizing, challenging, and critically reviewing the normative structures of power that enabled the world of places like Natal and settler colonialism in the 19th century more broadly, while paying a particular attention to moments of challenge and resistance. But by indigenizing queerness, I mean the difficult task of thinking through queerness as much, much more than an external intellectual project that can merely be mapped onto exotic and different contexts. We are not doing Miss Frizzle and the Magic Gay School Bus. We are not flying around the world pointing at shit and saying that is core, right? This work involves constant critical analysis that looks at sexual and gendered norms within indigenous African culture in Natal and also examines the ways in which these norms could then subvert or resist heteronormative settler orders. This is one reason why the chapter that this part of this talk came from and why when I think about this in general, I use the phrase ukupazama in Natali instead of queering Natal, right? And for that I use, because in Isizulu, uh, ukupazama means to disrupt, interrupt, or distract. Indeed, the noun form isipazamisa has been claimed as the root of the common South African phrase spaza, as the local home-based spaza shops were designed to disrupt or distract the regular capitalist pattern of patronizing white-owned businesses during the apartheid era. Now, while I found very few references to what Westerners would have termed non-heterosexual practices among indigenous Africans in the 19th century, they exist. I have seen the traces of them, and the erasure in sort of the white vision does not mean they don't exist, right? So I see them in English Zulu dictionaries prepared by missionaries that describe forms of male-male um, sexual socialization, um, and I think that Zaki Akhmat's study of the Ninevites in social text in 1993 is still like the gold standard of how we should really think about uh, sexual desire and theorize it. So this is some of what I wanted to get at today as someone that does queer theory and indigenous studies. I think that synthesis is powerful. And I think it's also really important for us to recognize that there are moments in which indigeneity is reserved and imagined in the limits of our own imagination to exist in certain spaces. And so I think there is a provocative synthesis for us to think about how might indigenous Africans be marginalized and also standardized in this way? So thank you, you sweet, beautiful wizards. I'm so glad I get to be here. <laughs> Do I get to say I'm a sweet, beautiful wizard? Yeah. <laughs> that was gorgeous. Thank you. That was so gorgeous. And I, you know, just to put this in conversation and connection, um, Dana's work on beating and the alternative imaginaries and alternative formations, the ways in which our more than human relatives gather in, you know, all of these different patterns and constellations is just, it brings it, you know, I'm just so excited by all of this conversation. How generous and gorgeous. Thank you so much, TJ. <laughs> so now um, I'm going to um, turn it over to Joseph Pierce. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Yay. Um, this has been so amazing and I'm really honored. Um, so, Osio Nigat Galielig Nigatijedo Kohik, Tla Ostiwoni, Chalagi, Aseno, Ganel Tisco, Chi Chalagi, Joseph, Dawado, Chalagi Gudino, Josawi, Dawado. Corpus Christi, Tige, Gaseno, No Brooklyn, Ginel, Stony Brook, Galuladilla, Junel Squad, Dagiluz Danejo. Um, hello, uh, thank you for um, inviting me. Um, I'm gonna let that introduction uh, stay as it was. And um, I want to acknowledge um, as we're talking about uh, relations that I relate to Cherokee identity through displacement and rupture through adoption and return. Um, so this talk is dedicated to the survivors of the 60s scoop 
and in hopes of an indigenous futurity. Um, so let us begin with the story. Um, a beloved woman is sick and the only medicine that can save her is tobacco. At, the at this time, the humans and the other than humans can still speak the same language. And so they hold a council and together they decide that four-legged creatures will be sent to retrieve the medicine from the geese who had taken it south. But all these attempts end in failure, in death. Even the mole, whose plan to sneak below ground is discovered by the geese, is killed. Another council is called in light of this tragedy, and the tiny hummingbird volunteers to retrieve the medicine, tobacco, and save the beloved woman. The rest of the creatures are not sure that hummingbird can accomplish this task, but they are desperate and agree to let them try. In the blink of an eye, they are gone and return with a sprig of tobacco and its seeds in their beak. The woman is saved by this medicine and this is how the Cherokee received the gift of tobacco. As with other stories in the Cherokee tradition, collaboration is central to improving the lives of all. Through speaking a common language and joining in council, the humans and other than humans share the responsibilities of healing and they share in the medicines that hummingbird brings back. It is not through human enterprise, cleverness or determination that the woman is saved. This is not a story about individual achievement. Rather, it reveals how a sense of interconnected mutual belonging is at the heart of Cherokee understandings of kinship, of being in good relations. Through our stories, we understand that we are connected to all things that have been and all things that will be. We recognize and are recognized by others as part of an emergent relationality through which the bonds of accountability and reciprocity are not restricted to the imposed epistemic arrangements of the colonial order. Cherokee scholar Daniel Heath Justice describes the quality of being a good relative as working, quote, to counter the exploitative forces of colonialism and the stories that legitimize them, while at the same time affirming or reaffirming better more generative, more generous ways to uphold our obligations and our commitments to our diverse and varied kin. In the Cherokee tradition, to be in good relations means honoring the ancestors and the future generations by making ethical decisions in the present regarding human and other than human kin. Like many indigenous communities, we draw on the wisdom of the past seven generations and think about the next seven generations when making decisions. By cultivating and harnessing the shared wisdom of kin, we create sustainable, mutually reinforcing relations. Or, as I would like to propose here, along with Karen Recole, we create installations. The term Constellation joins constellation and kin, but this neologism is not an attempt to describe a new or previously misunderstood phenomenon. Instead, it is an effort to foreground ancestral knowledge in the present. In this, I'm thinking alongside Cree scholar Karen Recole, who coined the term constellations, and I am arguing that resurgence, reconnection, and survivance can be enacted through kinstillatory imaginings, celestial resistance that is nevertheless grounded in indigenous epistemologies and centered on the land as a site of perpetual memory making. Kinstillations enact our ancestral knowledge of the stars, of our own stories of creation and of survival in an ongoing reflexive relationality that is non-hierarchical and ephemeral, lingering every day quotidian. It is an ongoing act, a praxis of indigenous refusal to acquiesce to colonial normativities, thank you Audra, specifically the ontological and the epistemological in favor of land-based understandings of reciprocity. Land, and by land I really mean territory, 
And by territory, I mean the expansive, consensual, emergent relations that we create by being with place, not a static place, but an ongoing iterative emplacement. And by emplacement, I mean ayehli, which is simultaneously the center where we are now, and also nation, chalagi ayetli, Cherokee nation. And so land, territory, ayehli holds memory, even when humans forget. Land holds bodies and medicine and spirits, even when humans no longer see them, even when colonizers destroy them too. Karen Recolle coined this term in a poem entitled Kin's Dilatory Gathering, which begins with the following lines. Kin's Dilatory Gathering spaces, wishful thinking through dimmed light, making meaning out of the shadows because sometimes shadow glyphs are all that we have left as our means for time travel. This is a placing, a landing of knowledge that at the same time points to a mode of ancestral fugitivity. Here, relations are not bound by the limits of reason or proportion, and especially not by the anthropological marking of kin on charts, genealogies, or family trees, but expands the scales of possibilities through which indigenous communities make meaning of and through the body. This meaning making shifts from the arborescent to the constellational, the web, the network and from the rational to the embodied. Gathering in constellation makes possible the resonating of bodies in relation, the reverberating kinetic sharing of space through which we begin to recall how to travel through time, how to speak to the shadows, how to negotiate our beings with and beings in relation as a form of ongoing enactment of indigenous sovereignty mutuality and care. I hasten to add, this is not a metaphor. The land is not fictive or chosen kin. Our bodies are not symbolically made of stars. We are those cosmic elements. And in recognizing ourselves as cosmologically interrelated, as connecting cross-temporally as part of an emergent and ongoing epistemological project, we maintain the bonds of reciprocity and collaboration that are at the heart of our stories. Recollet situates this grounded celestial knowledge as a method of time travel. This is also not a metaphor. When we look at the stars, we witness the past. Kinstillatory praxis is thus a form of trans-temporality that links stories of emergence with ancestral histories and future-oriented possibilities. These ways of knowing do not track onto normative timescapes, but rather are always situated in iterative becoming. In other words, constellations invoke an ancestral futurity that is grounded in our ways of relating to the human and the more than human across time, space, and feeling. Constellations are a means of living in the balance of rupture and creation. They mark us as poised across normative thresholds of intelligibility. In a collaborative work with Yupik dance maker Emily Johnson, another dear friend, Karen Recolle and Emily Johnson reflect on choreographies of kin making. And I'll quote uh, one more time. Kinstillatory describes a relational practice of being grounded when you are not of this place and considers the possibilities of rooting or routing toward the sky. This concept also refers to falling in love with rupture to mimic the practices of supernovas exploding to expel mass slash consciousness, thus providing the framework to jump scale through extending the potentials for multivariant grounding practices. Constellatory praxis is thus a method of negotiating the ruptures of time and space as they are felt in the body. These ruptures exceed the tools of settler colonialism, displacement, erasure, removal. 
the concept is about movement, choreography, and multiple bodies in motion. In this way, constellations are not simply stories we tell, but rather enactments of decolonial love and repair that are rooted in our bodies, epistemologies, and stories. A pause. So what is queer about this? Queer theory has never been able to describe what it means to be a relative from within an indigenous cosmology. This is because the discursive strategies that have been deployed by white, Anglophone, and Francophone queer theory are predicated on what a settler society requires as the queerness against which the normative is defined, the deviant, the degenerate. So here, think of Foucault and his long shadow. These terms have always carried with them the structural legacy of coloniality, which has always cataloged, analyzed, and displayed our queerness only in order to eliminate the vibrations of our bodies in relation as relatives, as kin. I realize this is a very long pause, so stay with me. When we, and now I'm speaking as and to indigenous people specifically, when we allow the regional variant of white, queer, anglophone, queer theory, because it is simply one variant of many, to universally determine what it means to be a relative, we have already abdicated to the history and the power of colonialism to govern what counts as belonging, what counts as relating. This is why I am not talking about queerness per se, but the constellations that we enact and enliven through our beings with, our beings in relation. Michitsagig Nishnabeg writer Leanne Betasamosake Simpson describes relational knowledge as part of the ongoing project of radical resurgence for many native communities. The pause was, is over, I'm back to the text. In concert with Glenn Coltard, Simpson argues um, that settler colonialism must not only be understood as the dispossession of land, but rather as an expansive dispossession, which means the gendered removal of our bodies and minds from our nation and place-based grounded normativities. This type of multifaceted dispossession is clear to me because it is part of my family's history. It is part of the histories of so many indigenous families. As a Cherokee person, I relate to the dispossession of kin through the memory of the trail where they cried, the trail of tears. I relate to dispossession of land too through the Dawes Act and the Curtis Act, whereby my kin were granted individual parcels of land, allotments, and forced to assume fee simple title and taxation on that land, that land which they subsequently lost because of a massive infrastructure project in Oklahoma that dammed the Canadian River to create Lake Eufaula so that white settlers could have energy, golf courses, and lake houses. Our allotment land was flooded like so many others, and we had to relocate. My grandmother, Ada, was also dispossessed of her language when she was forced to speak English in school she was dispossessed of my father when she had to give him up for adoption. My father was thus dispossessed of language and culture too. By that adoption, that rupture, this possession echoes through generations because it is not simply land that we lose because we do not think of it as land in the settler sense, but as our relationships with the land, which is our kin. In Cherokee, the term agilisi, my grandmother, does not refer to possession, the my. Rather, agilisi implies a reciprocity of action. The one who grandmothers me. It is a noun verb. In Cherokee, gender and kinship are action-oriented, not object-oriented as they are in English. Agichi or agilisi 
is a role and a praxis rather than a state of being. Perhaps this is queer or perhaps not. As I have been suggesting, that isn't really the right question. Because as I speak from my own body, from my own relations, I am not talking about deviation from a norm, nor am I talking about how norms are consolidated by taking up what is outside of them, queerness, to make sense of themselves. Rather, I am talking about relating across the breach of dispossession, across the interruptus, through the historicity of my own body as it relates tenuously to its own matter to its own leaning into and across a thwart toward joy, towards desire. For those many thousands of us affected by the boarding school system, the 60s scoop in so-called Canada, the stolen generation in so-called Australia, and the forced adoption of indigenous children by white families, the issue of return the community is necessarily predicated on restoring connections to and as kin. One way to do this, as I have been suggesting, is by creating or reconnecting to the constellations that place us within our own indigenous communities. Building constellations is how I understand what Leanne Simpson call, calls radical resurgence. Refusing the hierarchical, non-reciprocal relations that settler colonialism forces upon us is part of the radical project of resisting expansive dispossession. I think Audra Simpson might call this part and parcel with enacting the political sovereignty of our indigenous bodies because indigenous bodies produce indigenous political orders. And as such, precisely because of that alternative but not necessarily queer mobilizing of kinship, these constellations are a threat to the colonial order. I would like to conclude with a story as well. This one comes from Cherokee storyteller Hastings Shade, who describes the origin of the pine tree and the Pleiades. This is where they talk about the story of the boys. One of them, all he liked to do was dance, not regular dance, but stomp dance. Every time he walked out, that's all he did was dance. Then you don't tell him he'd quit on you. And as soon as he got a chance, he'd start dancing again. Pretty soon he had a circle with him, you know, dancing. And they kept saying, you need to quit. You don't do that all the time, just at certain times. But every chance he got, he would start dancing. So one day, there were several of them dancing and they went out there and they got onto him, his mother got onto him, but they just kept dancing, kept saying, no, you shouldn't dance, but they kept dancing. And pretty soon they began to rise, just went on up and became the bear constellation Nadiwi de lost, they say. There's no English translation for it. Ani jogon. So I don't know what that is, but that's what they were called. That's the end of that quote. The boys just want to dance. Their bodies rise from the earth as they practice the sacred ritual that is at the center of Cherokee ceremony around which the sacred fire burns, the fire that is the same fire that was given to us by creator, their bodies together rising, spiraling upwards like smoke from the sacred fire. In the movement of their bodies together, they become celestial. The constellation is formed of these boys, these children who would not stop dancing, who themselves became stars. There is no word for this. There is no English word for what these boys become, a constellation, the star people. In the version recorded by anthropologist James Moody, there are seven boys who like to play rather than do their chores. Their mother punishes them by giving them stones instead of corn for dinner, and the boys leave in protest and begin to dance around and around and around. They rise to the heavens. Their mother goes looking for them and manages or is scared 
and manages to pull one of them down. And as he strikes the ground, the ground swallows him up. The remaining six boys enter the heavens and become the Pleiades and their mother in her grief cries at the loss of her sons. And from her tears in the spot where the one son had been swallowed by the earth, a pine tree grows and reaches up towards the heavens. The son brought down to earth wants to return to his brothers and so becomes a pine tree reaching towards the heavens. The sky thus is full of our relatives. The plants to our kin want to reach out and touch the heavens, which is another way of saying to become whole again. The pine tree is celestial in this way, reaching up to reform kinship, to reattach to his brothers. This constellation is a form of reaching across the breach between earth and sky, between human and other than human, between body and spirit. Of course, the Pleiades is significant for many indigenous communities. For the Haudenosaunee, it is the hole through which sky woman, sky woman falls when she descends to earth. The story of sky woman falling from the heavens is crucial to how the Haudenosaunee and other people are descended from the stars and is an enactment of a constellation. When sky woman descends, the swans or the geese soften her fall. The turtle offers his back for her to land. Muskrat sacrifices himself, bringing up earth from the depths of the ocean that will grow around her and become Turtle Island. These constellations teach us about collaboration and care, about reciprocity, and about the space between realms. They teach us of time travel, of crossing the breach. It is tempting to describe this breach as a perpetual liminality, as queer, as the constitutive in-betweenness of being while not being, but the breach is more a feeling than a state of being, more potential than existential. It is also, if not primordially, a trace of future presence that calls from within, a beginning that has already begun. This sliding into materiality is like momentum, a force that oscillates between one thing and the next, between one and something else. In our constellations, we make sense of the abyss of infinite space and power, the sublime unfolding of space-time into ribbons of connective tissue. The gap between pine tree and star is a wound closing a scar like a heartbeat, like memory. We who have always been stars, we who are starring, returning to the heavens again as that which we were. The connective tissue of celestial healing is the very fact of our material life, the possibility of quotidian transcendence. This is the repair work of consolatory praxis, a doing of kinship, a being in good relations. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I am full. I feel so like, I feel like we've all like been in this space together and I, my voice is all shaky. I'm almost crying. It's just so beautiful. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh my gosh. Um, wow. <laughs> Um, so <clears throat> can I just, um, can we just hold space, um, for everything that was offered, uh, tonight, um, in a way that we think through what does ethical relationality look like for us in this moment of a pause, 
in order to think through how we are in relation with these geographies, these celestial becomings that folks have shared with us tonight. And just to receive the gifts and to find, to figure, to find through ways to be reciprocal in this meaning making, space making, these gestures of care that have been offered to us tonight. I just feel like, you know, we have questions, people have comments, but let's just hold space for all of this incredible thinking and relating that, um, that you have all shared with us tonight. And thank you so much. I think, you know, I think through what my responsibilities are for caring for, for as a witness for what that means. And I don't have all the answers right now, but I'm certainly gonna be following your practices of care as I, I think about, um, as I dream tonight and hold space for these sharings. So thank you so much. <clears throat> so we have a few minutes, I think. Uh, we have about six minutes. Um, <laughs> and, and to think through, I mean, people have questions. I also feel like maybe this is a continuing conversation, one that, um, you know, we have an archive, a beautiful archive of our witnesses in relationship to what you're, what you are offering tonight. And I'm seeing a lot of gratitude. I'm seeing folks saying these conversations are amazing. People are, you know, blown away by um, what, what has been offered tonight. Wanting to think alongside, um, you know, thinking through Black Indigenous presences and thinking through a relationship to Black queer diaspora studies, for example. You know, what happens when we fall into relation as people who embody these practices of trafficking, you know, such as, you know, the 60s scoop, which, you know, I have deep intimate relationships with that process of original rupture, right? So how do we fall into space, into relation um, within a diasporic positioning as well? <laughs> so what are some of those conversations? Um, so uh, folks are bringing up lots of um, how do we how do we navigate? How do we think through some of these complexities? And so um, I feel like you have all been so generous in offering um, these provocations. So I was just wondering with the time, the little time that we have, if you would like to be in conversation with each other, like just like a comment or a shout out to each other for um, maybe what landed with you tonight? What does, what does a pause, for example, or what does a beating, um, glyph make possible? What does tattooing make possible? What does being in relation with suturing and rupture, what does that make possible for us? So I just wanted to open up the space for, for you fierce thinkers um, to be in relation with each other if you'd like. I know we don't get to visit that often now. So is there anything that you'd like to offer for each other? As if we only have two hours to like really get into it, you know, I just feel like, whoa, the brains, the brains at the table right now. Ooh, just want to mush them together. So good. That's my comment. Yeah. <laughs> no, just like blown away sitting here and just like listening and just feel so good about that because all of those good, all of those things that you there were all those things, all of the concepts and everything that we're discussing. I've just been thinking about that and just like 
noticing how fast my beating is going. So thank you for that, Gitchy McWitch, because it's really carried me through. Like to bead for almost two hours straight is like is a huge feat. So it's really carried like a lot of these conversations have really carried me through. Yeah. TJ. <laughs> Do you have any, and if you don't, that's totally fine. Like you have all offered so much of yourselves tonight in such caring and generative ways. I do, I have a thought. I think one of the things first off is that, I mean, it's it's superfluous, right? Like, but it's it's such a, such a damn joy to be in the space with you guys and to think through this. But I think one of the other things, right? Is that I would say really quickly is that, um, Queerness is, is multiple things, obviously. And I loved when Joseph explicitly talked about like there are multiple flavors, there are multiple ambits of this, right? And we cannot just have like the, the one Anglophone and one Francophone like folk just telling us this. But I think that queerness can be something deeply intimate and powerful, right? To identify and to hold like a candle or a flame, right? But also queerness is a tool like a screwdriver. And I think that sometimes we can get so precious about that aspect of it that we don't recognize that it can be a tool. And I think that one of the things that, that Joseph gave us so well is a profound side-eyeing of queerness as claims, right? Like rem reminding us that queerness can be a screwdriver and it's like, it's like I'm a whole world. And you're like, girl, you a screwdriver, right? Like, like in, in explicitly talking about when by reframing this about relation, right? Saying like queerness sometimes as, a, as an intellectual project can thereby try and tell us the whole world. And you're like, let's put you back in, in scope, right? And so I, I feel like sometimes as a queer person who then has become a queer theorist, right? Like sometimes I feel like those, those that, that gets real fuzzy, that distinction, it's something that's deeply important to me, but it is also a tool. And I think having that, recognizing the limits of what a tool can be, right? I'm not so wedded to the screwdriver that I feel like my world has fallen apart because it is not a hammer or a curtain, right? So I think that that's, that's really useful and also my God, the three of you. And also Karen, my God, I read that poem last night and I cried in my room. So like I read it last night because I was like, let me let me know who she about. So like that, this relational work today just, just made my whole day. Joseph, do you have any final sort of offerings? Yeah, I am. I, um... I wanted to sort of just briefly comment on one of the questions about um, gender construction and 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 traditional indigenous values. I I, I think that this is um, I I don't want us to fall into what has been described really um, clearly by uh, the Red Nation Collective as toxic traditionalism, um, whereby sometimes we can say, well. Like we didn't have, we didn't have queerness free contact, right? Because queerness is an invention of Western modernity. So we didn't have to call it that, or there were other words for that, or there were ways of being that, that, that exceed the scope of queerness because they were not marginal, but central to the everyday ongoing relations of community. Um, so while also not wanting to sort of idealize or romanticize a kind of two-spirit sacredness that, that only happens in the past, um, not, not every, like there are a whole, like thousands of indigenous peoples, right? Like we're not all the same. And some of us have different ways of doing gender than others. And that's amazing. Um, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, queer theory doesn't have an answer to all of that. Um, so just like, like TJ saying, sort of take a, take a breath, queer theory, and like think about what you've done and then come back to the conversation with a little bit of like self-reflection and then we can talk, maybe. I think that's the point. Great theory is in timeout right now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Audra, do you have anything you'd like to offer or say? Beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, so much love. That was so, so generous of everybody. <laughs> and I think, um, I think I'm going to uh, sign out as well. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. It's been a, my honor to be in conversation with you fine people. Thank you. Thank you so much to you, Karen, for the thoughtful and really engaged, caring way you've moderated the event. Um, so thank you so much for that. And again, thank you to, to Dana and to Aja and to Joseph and to TJ for giving us so much to, to think with, for sharing, um, for sharing, for being in, yes, for being in relationship with, in relation to all of us right now, right? For sharing critique, which is another form of intimacy as well. Um, so thank you and thank you to everybody that has joined us uh, for this event. I very much appreciate your, your being here with us as well. Um, and uh, I hope I wish everybody um, to take good care. And thank you.